All right, I B A I S L two. Uh, today we're going to tackle eight point three, which is talking about the chi squared goodness of fit test. Um, it's a little bit different than a chi squared, a straight up chi squared independence test. Um, it's really well, it's right here on the star that uh, the chi squared goodness of fit test tells you whether or not the data fits around a particular distribution. Um, you may have seen more normal, normal distributions before. Uh, they're like, you know, if I was to give a class a, a bunch of tests and then look at all their scores, if you look at all the scores from, you know, low to high, that usually there's like a few low ones and then a lot in the middle and then a lot uh, and then a few really, really high ones. So this would be kind of like the average or the mean in the middle. Um, we're going to do two different types of goodness of fit tests today. And the first one is about example four. The students in year eight, that's how they say eighth grade in uh, Britain, are asked what day of the week their birthdays are on this year. Uh, the table shows the following results. So like, you know, 12 kids said that their birthday is on Sunday, 14 on Monday, 18 on Tuesday, 17 Wednesday, etc. cetera. Um, now the probability that somebody has a birthday on a certain day is not greater or less than other days. Like they should be kind of spread out evenly across the Sunday through Saturday, um, but these are not quite even. So the chi square goodness of fit test is gonna tell us basically like if the data is abnormal enough that you would say that they're, they're not like evenly distributed. Uh, it's not a uniform distribution. So part A. Write down the table of expected values, given that each day is equally likely. So um, if you add all these numbers together and divide them by seven, I believe that there's 15 uh, each that should be in those days. So if things were like, you know, all fair and it was like a, the expected value would be that 15 people would be born on each day. That's what we would expect, that it's a uniform distribution. Um, so basically the chi-squared goodness of fit test is gonna tell us if that this data is different enough from this data that we could reject the null hypothesis and say uh, that it doesn't satisfy a uniform distribution. So part B, conduct a chi-squared goodness of fit test. Uh, first, let's state the null and alternative hypothesis. So. The null is uh, the data satisfies a uniform distribution. That uniform distribution just means that uh, it's evenly spread out. Or it's, you know, it's the differences are not quite, you know, big enough that it, you would care that it actually is a, like a uniform distribution. But then you get into like, well, what if the differences are big enough? Then uh, the data would not have a uniform distribution. So, um, back up here, the degrees of freedom for a chi-squared goodness of fit test are not quite the same as the chi-squared independence test. Um, really, all you do is take the N, uh, the V, I don't know why they're using V right now, but degrees of freedom is V, and it's N minus 1. So it's just like the number of, um, not the pieces of data, but it's like the categories you have minus 1. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So degrees of freedom is gonna be seven minus one, which is six. Now, to be able to conduct a chi-square goodness of fit test, um, I'm gonna to link to a PDF um, in this lesson about how you can do the steps on a T84 calculator, but the uh, short and sweet of it Oops, is you're going to take these guys and put them into L1. All of your expected values you're going to put into L2. And then you're going to hit a different color. Um, second. No, uh, not second. Sorry. Stat. Tests. 
chi squared GOF test. So it's um, stat, which you guys are familiar with that button. Then tests, you are also familiar with because that's where the normal chi squared lives. But now you're going to do chi squared GOF test. Then make sure the observed and the expected that L1 and L2 are in there. And then you can change your degrees of freedom to six and then hit calculate. And then boom, you should get 0.953 for the p-value and 1.6 for the chi-squared. So that was us all, um, you know, just running a chi-squared goodness of fit test to be able to find a chi-squared and a p-value, which you guys are familiar with from last lesson. Part C, the critical value is 12.592. So they tell us the critical value right there. We don't have to look it up in a table like that table I originally showed you guys. Uh, we just have to test it against that. So uh, based off the chi-squared, 1.60 is less than 12.592. Also, the p-value, 0.953, which we're testing at a 5% significance, is bigger than 0 0.05. So if the P is low, reject the Ho. Uh, the P value um, is not low, so we're not rejecting Ho or accepting the Ho. And the chi-squared value is lower than the critical. So um, in with both of these rules, you accept the null hypothesis. Which means that the data does not satisfy a uniform distribution. So that was the chi-squared goodness of fit test uh, for looking if something has a uniform distribution. Now we're going to use chi-squared goodness of fit test, but it's slightly more complicated um, because we're going to try to figure out if things are normally distributed. So that last one was um, uniform distribution, which is that it's all fair across the board, they all have the same number. Now we're going to check if this has a normal distribution. Remember, a normal distribution is that bell curve. So we can use the chi-squared GOF test to see if this data has a normal distribution. Uh, these are IQ tests. IQ tests are normally uh, have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 10. So I'm going to highlight that information that we might need here. Uh, mean of 100, standard deviation of 10. Cinzia gives an IQ test to 200 IB diploma uh, program students in her school. Uh, the results are shown in the table. So uh, we're going to write down the null and alternative hypothesis here. Uh, the null hypothesis would be that the scores are normally distributed with a mean of 100. And uh, what's the symbol for standard deviation? I think it's that. Um, and then the alternative hypothesis, but they, they don't follow uh, scores. Come on, Jolly. Scores uh, are not normally distributed. So part B, find the expected values. The expected values is kind of tricky because you have to take um, the, uh, you have to use your calculator essentially uh, to tell you what the probability of falling within certain scores are um, with a normal distribution with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 10. So the way you're going to do that is you're going to hit second and then dister, and I'm also going to link put a PDF to this in our notes as well, but um, I'll just say normal 
distribution probabilities. Uh, second dister, which is a button above your VARS calculator, or VARS button. And then you're going to use normal CDF. So the way normal CDF works is you do your lower bound, your upper bound, your mean, and then your standard deviation. Um, if you're using like an 84 and 84 plus, it has a menu that helps you fill that stuff out. But ultimately, it just puts them on your, you know, when you paste after all that, it puts them on your uh, home page with commas in between them. So it looks like this in the end with normal CDF at the beginning of it. So to find this spot right here, um, sometimes when it goes like down to negative infinity or positive infinity, you just have to use a really huge number. Like, uh, and this is in the PDF I'm going to link to you guys, but you know, you do like normal CDF and then do negative one E to the 99 all the way up to 90. So just make a note that, you know, this part is going to be uh, negative one E to the 99. And the E button is right above your comma button if you can't find it. Um, when you do that, you do negative one E to the 99 and then 90 is your upper. And then uh, your mean is 100 and your standard deviation is 10, which they told us in the beginning that the, the mean is 100 and the standard deviation is 10. If you paste that all in there and hit enter, you should get 0 0.025. Is that what the book's getting? No. What happened? Hold on, did I put something in wrong? Oh, that was weird. Yeah, 0 0.158. That's what they got. So that means the probability of a score falling being less than 90 is 0 0.158. But there are 200 scores or per people taking this test. So you have to multiply all these times 200 to get the actual expected score because the 0.158 was just the probability. The expected score is how many kids you would expect to score less than 90 on their IQ test that are in the diploma program which is 31.7. Then if you repeat that process using normal distribution or normal CDF and then your lower upper bound mean of 100 standard deviation of 10, you should get these probabilities where the next one is 0.3413. Then the next one is also 0.3413. Then 0.1359. Then 0 0.0214, and then 0 0.00135. I guess with these, like three or four significant figures is probably what you guys should do. If you multiply those all by 200, you get 68.3, 68.3, 27.2, 4 and 0.270. So these are what you would expect for uh, the amount of people scoring IQs within the population that are between those ranges. Now, part that was part B. Part C says, if any expected values are less than five, then rewrite both tables. If I look at all these values right here, there are two of them that are less than five. In fact, these two are a problem because they're less than five. So what they want us to do is take both of those and then just lump them into this category right here. So we're going to like condense the table. So we're going to keep everything the same with the observed. Oh, the observed was just the original data, which was 5, 14, you know, from 0 to 90, there was 5, then there was 14. And then up here, there was 74. But then the last three categories get condensed because in the original table, anything past here is going to get all lumped together because we're lumping these three together. So when you lump 
58, 34, and 15 together, you get 107. Now we'll do the same thing with the expected values, that the first four are totally fine, or the first, sorry, the first three are the same, that this one should be 31.7, this should be 68.3, this will be 68.3 again, but then this spot right here is gonna be all three of these numbers together, which if you add 27.2, 4.28, and 0 0.270, you get 31.7. Now we're going to run a chi-squared goodness of fit test on this. So once again, uh, you're going to take all of this column, your observes, and put them into L1. You're going to take all your expected, put them into L2. And then you'll go uh, stat test chi-squared GOF. Um, degrees of freedom in this problem for part D, we'll notice that there's four things we're looking at, four categories that are going to get put in the goodness of fit test. So if you take one off of that, it's like V is equal to four minus one. So there's three degrees of freedom. If you punch that all in into L1 and L2 and run your goodness of fit test, you should get uh the chi-squared value is 245. Oh my gosh, that's huge. And the p-value is 7.89 times 10 to the negative 53rd. This is very small number. <laughs> so what this means, uh, if we're testing it at 10%, it really doesn't even matter. Um, Let's just use the p-value to say uh, that the p is less than 0 0.10, which means if the p is low, you reject the hoe. So we reject HO except H1, which if you go back up here, H1 said that the scores are not normally distributed. at least not with a mean equal to 100 and a standard deviation of 10. So yeah, all that to, to say, no, they're not actually normally distributed like they should be with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 10.